Uh, I am going to stand in as best I can uh, for uh, for Bill. Uh, again, he was the uh, the district ranger agency administrator during this incident. Uh, I happen to be his zone FMO, so uh, we we kind of lived through this together. He sent me his notes, and so I'm going to do my best to try to convey uh, agency administrators. Uh, perspective on this event now 14 years later. Okay, just uh, to get us uh, oriented, uh, this fish fire occurred on the uh, uh, on the Flat Tops Wilderness, which is within the uh, White River National Forest in Northwest Colorado. So before we start talking the specifics of this fire, uh, it's important to kind of uh, look at some of the background of, uh, of the events that led up to it, uh, some of the conditions leading to the event. So uh, in the 1940s, uh, there was a major insect epidemic that kind of swept through the flat tops and essentially decimated the, the uh, spruce fir forest that was there. Uh, a lot of the locals there in the Meeker area referred to it as the ghost forest. Uh, for, for years after uh, this epidemic went through, uh, the trees died. Uh, the bark sloughed off and, and the forest uh, uh, appeared white. There was lots of uh, white stems up there. They referred to it as the ghost forest. Uh, you know, fast forward uh, several years, a lot of dead trees fell over, a lot of new trees grew up. So a lot of the flat tops, the majority uh, of it, was a continuous uh, uh, uniform timber stand with heavy, heavy dead fuel loadings underneath it. Uh, so that's that's kind of the fuel situation that was set up by this by this uh, insect event in the 1940s. Fast forward to uh, 1994, South Canyon fire, uh, just 13 miles uh, to the south. Uh, one of the the bigger tragedies in the in the wildfire community uh, occurs. Um, that seven days later, right after that, uh, this forest, this unit uh, had a fire by the by the name of the Ute Creek Fire. And the forest supervisor at the time, uh, Sonny LaSalle, uh, made a conscious choice uh, decision to uh, manage that fire for firefighter safety and the ecological benefits uh, that it could produce in the Flat Tops Wilderness. And, and that, was a, that was a big gulp uh, at that time, given the circumstances. End result of that particular fire was about 3,000 acres uh, of, of uh, beneficial fire within the uh, flat tops wilderness. So they had that experience and they had something to then take to both internal and external parties and say, hey, look, this, this worked. And so the result of that Ute Creek event uh, was the development of the flat tops wilderness fire management plan. And so they, they went out, uh, did a lot more study and did a lot more thinking about it and came up with a plan on, on here's how we intend to uh, use fire and manage fire within the flat tops wilderness. That helped really strengthen the internal and external communications. And, and Bill says this is something he took with him every time he went to go visit with county commissioners, uh, the mayor, city council, local leaders uh, in the communities there to make sure they knew this was the intent on this unit. So that kind of sets the stage for uh, for where this this event was going. So. Uh, jump ahead to 2002, uh, lightning start in the Flat Tops Wilderness on the Blanco Ranger District. Um, initial decision on this fire was to allow fire to play its natural role in wilderness. It did occur within the wilderness area. Uh, confine it to the wilderness boundary as best we could uh, and protect people, visitors, and adjacent structures uh, it, it was close to the uh, wilderness boundary and there were uh, uh, the, uh, various structures surrounding there, including Rio Blanco Ranch, Trappers Lake Lodge, and uh, a campground trailhead uh, recreation complex near Trappers Lake. The rationale that kind of went into this was uh, ignition dates were comparable to Ute Creek. So it was like, okay, this is pretty close to what we've experienced before. Uh, the local community uh, supported the idea of seeing fire up there. Again, you know, this was a lot of dead material out there and folks, you know, complained that, hey, we can't even go running around there in our horses or hiking. You can go for a mile out there without ever touching the ground because of all the downfall. Uh, so there's local community support. Uh, it's in the northeast corner of the Flat Tops Wilderness. A, a big area of, uh, up there could anchor the program 
for years and years to come. Prevailing winds are from the southwest in this area, and so establishing that anchor there uh, with, with a good fire uh, could really pay off benefits for years and years to come. Uh, another thing, just a month before this one, the coal seam fire. This occurred in the same general area as the uh, South Canyon fire. Um, but this one went from initial start to end of the town of Glenwood Springs uh, uh, and loss of 29 structures uh, within a couple of hours. And so this fire uh, really caught the attention of the fire community. A couple of days after coal seam was the Heyman fire in Colorado. Uh, this idea of, hey, we are up against the wall and we're seeing fires that are really, really uh, posing dangerous circumstances to us. Uh, and we need more burned holes out there in this flat tops wilderness to give us some future advantage. Uh, uh, that also played into to the uh, thought process there. So initial actions, uh, no direct action was taken. There was slow to moderate growth. We, uh, an incident management team was brought in. At that time, uh, they, they were called the fire use management team. Uh, resources were ordered. We were preparing for a large campaign. Uh, over the next several, uh, about a week and a half, uh, got a great plan together, assessed the structures, got things ready. We were in the starting blocks ready to go. Uh, then it rained about two inches. Uh, July 26th, 27th, about two inches of rain. Uh, fire's about 50 acres at this time. And uh, didn't look like it was going to recover for a while. So everybody packed up and went home. And the local unit continued to monitor. So this is what it looks like at the end of uh, that two inch rain event. And again, 50 acres, that's kind of, that's pretty liberal. It's if you connect the dots with all the spots, you might get 50 acres uh, out of this one. So uh, this is what it looks like. And it's just barely, uh, barely hanging on. But two weeks later, this is uh, 2002, which as we found out as the season progressed, uh, was going to be one of the uh, record setting uh, dry and hot years in, in uh, the central Rockies. Uh, it woke, woke back up. And so it, it came back to life and we started to get geared up to, to implement this great plan that we had. So over the next couple of days, uh, goes from 50 acres to 100 and something. And, and you've all seen how these stories uh, progress. Uh, from the 14th to the 15th, the fire goes uh, from this side. This is looking up big fish drainage to the south. Um, spots then come out here to the other side of the big fish drainage and, uh, and some more fire gets established out this side. So here's the progression map. Um, so you can see right here is the fire origin. So over the 14th you get the initial spots across big fish drainage. This is big fish drainage here. And then on the 15th you get a little bit uh, more fire growth here. And then this little progression to the north, including a little spot out this way, uh, sets things up for the 16th. Um, again, the location of the uh, areas of concern, Rio Blanco Ranch right here. This is a guest ranch, uh, uh, kind of owner-operated, uh, exclusive use guest ranch. Uh, here, uh, this Trappers Lake Lodge um, is a uh, for service owned land with leased uh, property. Uh, private buildings on there for recreation use, so there's cabins, a lodge, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then uh, a trailhead here at the uh, and campground at Trappers Lake. And so you can see the next day, uh, weather forecast calls for a cold front passage with uh, winds coming out of the northeast and with the alignment of the, uh, of the fire here, uh, no longer all in the big fish drainage, but now in the White River drainage south fork of the White River. Uh, it aligns for a major run up towards Trappers Lake. So August 16th, uh, cold front passage comes through. Uh, northeast winds about 45 miles an hour, approximately 10,000 acre run. Uh, and uh, 24 structures, uh, structures were of concern. The other thing was uh, there was still people in there, uh, cars at the trailhead. Uh, there, there was uh, certainly both life and property concerns. Uh, this is the view of, of the fire from Meeker, about 25, 30 miles away. You had to get that far away to actually capture it. 
And so this is uh, some of the aftermath of, of that uh, run at Trappers Lake Lodge. Um, total of eight structures uh, were lost, including the lodge uh, itself, which was kind of the main, uh, the, the main uh, part of the business there, as well as a few uh, guest lodges and uh, you know barn, tack room, uh, some of those uh, structures. But uh, you know that was uh, that was one bad day, but uh, things weren't done yet. So the following day, uh, there's still a whole lot of fire in this continuous fuel bed uh, over the top of Rio Blanco Ranch. Um, however, uh, by that time, we we had enough uh, time to have been prepared for it, and uh, all structures were protected. The fire was held within the wilderness boundary. Um, if you see this photo down here, you can see a fence line. Uh, that is the wilderness boundary. Uh, so the wilderness boundary here comes right up to uh, the, the structures as we see in a lot of places. So the outcomes, uh, you know, again, it's the paradox. There's some, some great outcomes. There's 17,000 acres there uh, in the flat tops. It's a mixed severity. There's high patches, uh, high severity patches uh, with some low and moderate. It's an exceptionally good fire in terms of future fire management. We've got our anchor, uh, fire ecology. It's, it's great in that respect. Nobody got hurt uh, during this engagement. Not so good. Structures lost is, is not a good thing. Uh, back to a ghost forest. Uh, you know, 14 years later, we're going back and taking a look at things. That, that little social part there uh, didn't get solved. Uh, we still have a lot of uh, stems out there that bark is sloughed off, still looks like a white forest. Uh, the Rio Blanco Ranch itself, we basically shut them down uh, for the season. And then afterwards, you know, some of the uh, guest owners there decided, you know, we don't like the looks of this, so, so we're out. So we, we had some negative effects on, on people directly. Yeah, here's, here's a look of uh, big fish drainage, and you, know, you kind of look at the mosaic pattern there. So, you know, there's some good stuff. Uh, this is what it looks like as of 2014. You're getting great regeneration. There's aspen coming back in places where we thought aspen had disappeared. But here's the paradox. Uh, and uh, how many folks are, are familiar with Trapper's Lake uh, itself? It's, it's relevance in, in wilderness. So uh, for those of you who are not, uh, in uh, 1919, this guy with a funny backpack by the name of Arthur Carhart showed up there and his intent was to figure out how we're gonna build houses around this thing. He took a look at Trapper's Lake and said, you know, maybe we should back off of this. And the whole idea of wilderness preservation kind of was born from that. So this is the place known as the cradle of wilderness where the, the notion of wilderness uh, was born. And in a place like this, we still have this paradox between human interests and nature's and wilderness's interest and how do we balance those, those two things. So here's some of uh, here's some of Bill's reflections. Uh, Pre-planning and an ongoing community dialogue were key. Uh, you know, when when things go go bad in a highly visible fire, your ability to prevail. Uh, and this, this is Bill's words: uh, are somewhat in a somewhat positive outcome correlate directly with your planning and pre-work, particularly with the local community uh, that you didn't advance. Uh, his second point is the, the fuels work, don't delay. Uh, in this particular instance, we had uh, fuels work to, uh, to help with the protection of some of those values, including the campground complex as well as the lodge. Uh, it was in the planning process. Again, this is 2002, national fire plan money didn't show up till 2001. We were just getting started with the planning, um, but it, fire kind of beat us to the punch. So you know, his, his message was don't delay, get, get the fuels work done, uh, that'll, that'll help. Um, Preparing the staff internally for what management of, of this kind of fire is going to do to them. Uh, that, that was something he wanted to pass on, is that uh, making sure your staff is ready prepared and they know that this is going to be, uh, you, you might cancel some softball games. Uh, this is going to have an impact to you uh, uh, and, uh, and you're going to be get asked tough questions at the grocery store. And so making sure that your, your staff knows what the whole bunch of you are getting into. Um, and then finally, the uh, uh, Bill's message was that you know a, a fire for benefit with, le with less than positive 
outcome uh, is not a career ending event, though it may seem like it at the time. Uh, be prepared to share your lessons with others so that the whole community can benefit in a positive, uh, in a positive manner. And even though it's somewhat cliche, when things go poorly, if you can respond in a somewhat positively manner, uh, you yourself will grow as a leader. So those were, uh, those were Bill's uh, kind of Bill's message to us uh, in, in him reflecting back 14 years on, on this particular event. And so kind of the epilogue uh, of this. Um, this last summer, uh, we had the lost solar fire in the Flat Tops Wilderness. Uh, lightning caused uh, August 8th, southwest uh, of Big Fish against southwest prevailing winds in this area. And as, as we had imagined 14 years ago, uh, Big Fish sat there downwind acting as a, uh, a buffer, which you know, re reduced their risks and, and increased their chance of success in managing uh, lost solar, which they essentially monitored uh, without really engaging uh, that much and, and came up with about 4,500 acres of uh, beneficial fire. So with that, that is uh, just Bill's, Bill's story there. Um, I can attempt to answer a question, but again, I'm, I'm kind of standing in for, I only play Bill Honenberg on TV. Um, but we've got a, a great panel coming up. Uh, okay, well, thanks. And then I guess just one more uh, uh, sideline on that is that the, uh, uh, I forgot to mention in this picture, the top right, uh, that's the new lodge. Uh, turns out they had great insurance. Uh, a new lodge was built, which was bigger, faster, stronger than before. And their, their business is doing as well as ever uh, at, at this particular area. I can't say the same for the Rio Blanco Ranch, but uh, you know, again, that, that's, that's part of the, uh, the backstory there. So uh, thanks. And I think now we're going to get ready for, uh, for our panel.